My name is David Lyndon Meyer and I'm from the Fenner School of Environment and Society at the Australian National University. And this talk is about natural asset farming. And I'm part of an initiative at the ANU called Sustainable Farms. And a key component of Sustainable Farms is to look at natural assets on farms, be they farm dams, shelter belts, revegetated areas, scattered paddock trees, rocky outcrops and other kinds of natural assets. And our approach really focuses on all kinds of farms because all farms have natural assets. And this approach allows us to engage with a whole range of kinds of farmers from regenerative agriculturalists through to natural sequence farmers and other people. And it means that farmers can start small and build up to doing more and more large scale landscape projects. And we also know that some of these key natural assets such as rocky outcrops are extensively overlooked. So the basis on which we work is from large scale long term studies and the red arrows indicate all of the large scale long term land care related kinds of projects throughout Eastern Australia on the mainland. And so our work spans uh, nearly 24 years now and 745 different sites across those years throughout southeastern Australia. And these sites vary in condition and type through from tree plantings to mixed farming landscapes right through to individual paddock trees. And some of the data that we collect uh, around biodiversity includes uh, things to do with the plant species composition, the structure of the vegetation, uh, the response of different animals to these nat natural assets from birds, reptiles and mammals, and through to the, the structural attributes of the vegetation, for example, hollow trees, the amount of woody vegetation, etc. And so what we want to do for the remainder of this talk is to talk about some of the, the new insights into restoration that's come from these large scale long term studies. And the first natural asset that I wanted to talk about with some very new work on farm dams, some of which is not yet, yet published. Now farm dams are a really important part of the, the natural assets and the natural infrastructure on farms throughout Australia. The estimate is that presently there's nearly 1.8 million farm dams in Australia. In the Murray-Darling Basin alone on the mainland part of Australia, more than 650,000 individual farm dams and preceding the last uh, major drought, we estimate that around about 97% of those farm dams were in very poor condition. Now those poor conditioned dams support very poor quality water. And what we know from work done overseas is that when stock drink poor quality water, they have lower body weights. And these farm dams in poor quality condition often generate large amounts of greenhouse gas emissions because the dams fill up with, uh, with excrement and then on top of that, if there's a rain event, that washes in and we have methane emissions, nitrous oxide, etc. So we know that there's been billions of dollars in the livestock industry spent on breeding, pasture improvement, but almost nothing spent on water quality for livestock. Now we've known since Roman times that if mammals drink poor quality water, they tend to get sick and it's unlikely that livestock is going to be much different. So we've been working a lot on this notion of improving the, the condition of the vegetation around farm dams and also improving the quality of the water within farm dams. And so there are some things that can be done to improve that quality that are quite straightforward. So the farm dam can be fenced, it can be revegetated around the margins and surrounding areas, and you can put in a hardened access point to allow livestock access to the water without damaging the vegetation surrounding the farm. And so we've been studying what happens when we when this happens. And what we've discovered is that when you plant vegetation around dams, very quickly you start to see major improvements in water quality. So for example, we can reduce E. coli levels in farm dam water by up to 50% within six months of renovation actions taking place. We also know that the water temperature is lower, so it means that that water is more likely to be suitable for livestock consumption. And it also lasts for longer because there are lower evaporation rates. And what the North Americans have found is that when livestock drinks better quality water, 
there's an up to 23% gain in livestock weight gain. So this is really quite a significant change in animal welfare. The other thing that happens is that when you renovate farm dam areas, you see much better biodiversity outcomes. And we've seen that regularly from our repeated surveys of farm dams in southeastern Australia. We've done a net cost benefit analysis, looking at what happens in terms of financial gains through better productivity, that's the weight gain through livestock. And what we see is that the benefit cost ratio in New South Wales is about 1.5 and in Victoria it's 3.0. So this, these are differences associated with rainfall and livestock density rates across different areas. So the weight gain needed for the switch to clean water is actually very, very small. It's only 1.8%. But we know that in North America, the weight gains can be up to 23%. So the pro probability of benefit being much greater than cost is more than 70%. Okay. So let's move to another kind of key natural asset on farms, and these are plantings. And this is an extensive outcome of Landcare efforts and natural resource management agencies efforts over the last 30 years. So we've done a lot of work for more than 20 years looking at the benefits of plantings and how plantings should be managed. So the next uh, few minutes we'll focus on what happens when we graze plantings and changes in biodiversity. So we know that what's happening is that in many cases, as a result of, of land care and the Natural Heritage Trust dating back into the 1990s, that many plantings were established and they were fenced. And now 20 something years later, those fences are starting to degrade. And so what we need to look at is what happens when we have grazing in plantings and compare that to plantings that are ungrazed. And the changes in the fencing infrastructure allow us to do that. So as the plantings are aging, the fences are becoming more, more and more degraded. And what we see is that grazing alters the leaf litter layer and it changes the mid-story cover within plantings. And a statistical analysis called path analysis shows that we see significant negative impacts of grazing in plantings on not only birds, but also reptiles. And we published that work in 2018. So this is what we call a path analysis, this diagram. And what it shows is that there's an important effect of the age of plantings on bird species richness at the top. There's also an important effect of width that influences mid-story cover. But once plantings start to be grazed, uncontrolled grazing reduces the amount of leaf litter. The amount of leaf litter is very important for bird species richness. So what's actually happening here is that once plantings are grazed, it changes the leaf litter layer it changes the mid-story cover, and that has a knock-on impact on bird species richness. So now let's think about what's happening with the changes in climate and weather that we're seeing across many landscapes. And what we actually see is that plantings turn out to be critical bird refugia during drought periods. And this is particularly true for small-bodied bird species, which in many cases are our birds of conservation concern. So these small birds are strongly associated with plantings and the effects of plantings as drought refuges are strongly seen, particularly during the really dry periods. And those effects then dissipate during the wetter periods and then come back to being really important in the subsequent drier periods. And so here's the paper that's published from that again in 2018 about why plantings are really important drought, drought refuges during changing climate. The other thing that we see is that plantings uh, in mainland Australia particularly are really um, very important for controlling noisy miners. So the noisy miners are hyper aggressive native honey eater species and high abundances of this species are listed as a key threatening process in temperate woodlands in many parts of Australia. And our long term data clearly indicate that replantings with an understory have few noisy miners. And also what happens is that when an understory is planted into an old growth woodland as an enhancement planting, that also drives down the number of noisy miners, an effect that takes about eight years once the underplantings are reestablished. And this is what the data looks like. The probability of detection of the miner 
noisy miner declines with the increasing amount of acacia in the understory and it also declines with the increasing number of years since enhancement. So to tackle the problem of the noisy miner as a problematic bird that drives away many other woodland species, rather than culling birds, which has been recommended by some people, it's better to use trees to change the habitat to make it unsuitable for the noisy miner and make it more suitable for the many woodland birds. So what we know from long-term monitoring is that the attributes of good plantings include these. They're much more likely to be in gullies where we get higher bird species richness compared to mid slopes and ridges. Larger plantings do better, but the, the context of the planting is really important. So plantings that are established near other plantings or plantings that are established near patches of remnant vegetation tend to do really well. Block shaped plantings are, tend to do better than strips particularly because narrow strips are often um, invaded and colonized by noisy miners. Final thing is, or the second final thing, is that plantings that contain logs or large old trees and understory tend to be the places where we have the highest bird species richness and the highest richness of other groups, such as possums and gliders and reptiles. And finally, plantings that are fenced tend to do a lot better than those that are not fenced, particularly plantings that are grazed and grazed heavily. Now the only reason that we know some of these things is from long-term monitoring and so our data over the last 20 odd years really does tell us a lot about how plantings fit into the scheme of the, of the portfolio of natural assets on a farm. So why do on-farm land care efforts really matter? Well, in more recent times, the Australian government's been looking at developing training platforms for biodiversity credits and carbon credits, and looking at incentive schemes such as stewardship payments and certification schemes to help with that. And so the ANU has partnered with the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment to develop the platforms, methods and schemes to, to, uh, to really make these biodiversity stewardship schemes work. And so we're running a carbon and biodiversity pilot at the moment. And, and under these pilots, there'll be cash payments for farmers to generate biodiversity benefits. And this will be interlinked with the emissions reduction fund so that we can make sure that we have biodiverse carbon in farming landscapes to create additional income streams for landholders in these kinds of environments. So in summary, improving the natural assets on farms is key. And Landcare has been doing just this for decades, although now what we're starting to see are that there are other things that can be done, for example, renovating farm dams to not only boost livestock production, but to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, improve outcomes for biodiversity and improve outcomes for animal welfare. So there's still much to learn in this space, but evidence is really critical. We need good evidence through monitoring to then be able to exchange knowledge between scientists and practitioners management uh, through farming and farming partnerships to really, really drive the innovation that's needed in the farm sector and the land care sector and the scientific sector as well. Now these need to be long-term partnerships because change takes time, especially in these slow changing environments that we work in in agricultural Australia. So we've worked really hard to try to make sure that we can help uh, communicate that knowledge and this is a little booklet that we've produced about ways to improve the natural assets on farms. And then in more recent times, we've extended that to create a new book, which will be out early next year on natural asset farming. So a lot of this work is built around the Sustainable Farms Initiative at the ANU. And I hope that you might visit the website. And if you need further materials, then please don't hesitate to connect with us and we're happy to send happy to send out further information thank you very much